Hello everybody, this is Zach Hartman with BrainMass.com and I'm going to be talking to you today about protein purification. So what's this lecture about? We're going to be talking today about how to isolate proteins. Why is this knowledge important? First, our understanding of biology as it relates to cells and physiology is built on knowledge gained by isolating proteins. And without these techniques, our ability to push studies forward would be nearly impossible. The pharmaceutical industry also relies heavily on protein purification. Proteins themselves are critical for in vitro assays, that is to say, analyzing the activities of different drugs against proteins in test tubes. Proteins can also be the drugs themselves, however. As of recently, cancer scientists have been researching different kinds of proteins that are specifically able to recognize, identify, and then kill cancer cells without damaging the host. Finally, they can also make use of crystallography in order to determine the structure of a protein so that they can rationally design inhibitors against certain proteins for use in drug development. So no matter what protein we're going to isolate, we're generally going to follow one simple road map. First, we must consider the source of the protein from which we're going to isolate it. Then we must consider how we're going to disrupt the tissue from which the protein grew. Then we must take this disrupted tissue and clarify it somehow, separating it into a bulk mixture of proteins. This bulk mixture then has to be refined using chromatography techniques. And then finally, we can determine the purity and yield of the protein from the purification. In part one of this lecture, we're only going to focus on the first three steps of this roadmap. And then in part two, we'll focus on the final two steps. So like I said before, first we need to consider the different kinds of sources of proteins that we're going to isolate from. These are going to include the natural sources and the recombinant DNA based protein sources. Now when I'm talking about natural protein sources, you can intuitively guess that I'm talking about plant and animal tissues. This source of protein is going to be ideal in only a number of certain applications. For example, if you're studying a toxin called ricin, you'll want to situate yourself near the Mediterranean basin where castor oil plants are grown. If you study hemoglobin, the protein found in blood, you'll find an ample supply of animal blood near slaughterhouses from which to isolate the protein. In many cases, there is no abundant natural source of the protein that you're interested in, so you can make use of recombinant DNA technology. What do I mean by this term? Basically, we're taking a foreign piece of DNA and we're going to insert it into cells. The cells will translate this into a protein which we can then purify. And so in this way, we're actually thinking of cells as a sort of protein factory. And then we can purify it from this source. We have many options when it comes to selecting the right kinds of cells into which we're going to put the foreign DNA. There are four types that we're going to be commonly using that include bacteria, yeast, insect, and mammalian cells. Each has its own pros and cons. Bacteria are the most simple and most easily cultured system for generating protein, so we can make lots of it very quickly. In addition, inserting foreign DNA into bacteria is quite simple. Unfortunately, since they're prokaryotes, they lack distinct cell compartments. So if you want, for example, a protein that's normally going to be put into the nucleus of animal cells, bacteria might not be able to process it correctly. Yeast offer a fair compromise in terms of their similarity to bacteria. They're able to make large amounts of protein very quickly, but they also have the compartments since they're eukaryotes, and they have more of the processing machinery to make the right proteins. Unfortunately, they don't have all of the machinery that they would need to make all of the modifications that a protein can go through. To make proteins that are most like those found in animals, we're going to need animal cells, like insect or mammalian cells. These ones can make the most protein modifications, but it's expensive. Culturing them is complicated and prone to a number of problems. And introducing foreign DNA into insect and mammalian cells is not always a very simple matter. All in all, there's a trade-off of protein complexity for the time, expense, and difficulty you're going to go through in getting the protein. So you have to choose your system very carefully. Now regardless of which protein source you choose, the next step that we have to follow is going to be common to all of them, 
first we're going to have to amplify the protein. We're going to grow a farm of the plants. We're going to harvest blood from an animal. We're going to grow the cells in culture. And then we have to disrupt them in order to relieve them of the protein of interest. Disruption means we're basically breaking open those cells or the tissue in order to obtain a bulk mixture. And this is going to contain the lipids, the DNA, cytoskeletal proteins and the cytoplasm, and all the compartments of the cells. And there are two classifications of disruption methods that we're going to be talking about. They include mechanical and non-mechanical. The first of the mechanical disruption methods we'll talk about is homogenization. This technique is most commonly used to break up plant and animal tissues, and it's essentially similar to a blender that you would use in your kitchen. We subject the sample to the homogenizer, and the sample is then guided toward a metal rod that's spinning very quickly. This rod smashes the sample against an impact ring, creating a large force that will break the tissue open. The second mechanical disruption method we'll talk about today is sonication. This method works well especially with cellular sources of protein. First we stick a metal probe into our liquid sample that contains the cells of interest, and then we force it to vibrate rapidly. This vibration produces ultrasonic sound waves from the probe, and these sound waves are going to create a shearing force that will cut up cell walls and DNA in a very rapid manner. An alternative to sonication that is commonly used is known as French press. Here we fill a metal chamber with a sample that contains the cells we want to break. We then push down on the sample using a piston, which raises the pressure. By turning this valve, we can let out small amounts of the sample at a time, and the sudden drop in pressure as the cells exit the chamber cause them to burst open and relieve their contents. One of the more common non-mechanical disruption methods that we'll use is enzymatic digest. And this is going to be good for any of the cells or tissues containing cell walls. And that could be certain types of bacteria, yeast, or plants. First, what we'll do to the cells is we'll subject them to an enzyme, such as lysozyme, which is going to chew open the cell wall. And we'll get rid of the enzyme, and we'll subject the remaining parts of the cell to detergents, which will solubilize the cell membrane and very gently release the contents inside the cell. Of course, there are other disruption methods that we did not go into, but once we've broken open those cells, the next step is common. We're going to have a complex mixture of proteins, lipids, DNA, and other cellular components, and we're going to need to separate as much of the non-protein parts from the others as we can. The most common means of performing this separation is centrifugation. Here we simply spin the sample at a high speed so that the larger and insoluble components will form a pellet that can be separated from the protein containing supernatant, or the liquid that sits on top of the pellet. There are many more complex applications for centrifugation, but a discussion of these methods moves a little bit beyond the scope of this lecture. So suffice it to say that separation is going to be carried out by centrifugation. So that wraps up part one of our lecture on protein purification. Come back soon for part two where we discuss what we do with this mixture of proteins. How can we refine it using chromatography? We'll also be discussing how to determine the purity and yield from the protein purification. So be sure to check out part two.